thank you everyone for tuning in gross marketing webinar and for today we're honored to have julian ex product localization manager of airbnb apac to share his lessons of localization when he was uh in his close to four year tenure in airbnb so without further ado let's welcome julian for his sharing great thanks hey. for the introduction amber um yeah my name is julian uh, i'll be a presenter today and uh, first of all i want to thank growth marketer academy for inviting me to share some of my insights on this topic um let's see uh just a little bit of introduction uh, i've been working as a digital product manager for the past seven plus years um, i'm currently sitting in shanghai in, in my office and um, i'm working as Goat's product owner um, for the China market. Um, and I've previously worked in and studied in a few countries, including uh, countries and region, including Hong Kong, USA, Singapore, and, and now I'm in mainland China. So for a majority of this presentation, I'm gonna be drawing my experiences from Airbnb, um, where I was their first, um, one of their first two localization managers, as well as the first product manager um, in the Asia Pacific region. So uh, let's get started. But before um, I do that, uh, I want to go through a few house rules and set the right expectations. Um, first of all, the presentation will be conducted in English. Um, I see some of you in the audience that are um, not from Hong Kong or from, from China, so I'll be giving this um, in English. Uh, the slides, I believe, have already been shared as handouts, so don't worry about, you know, taking screenshots or, or downloading them later. Um, if you need it, it'll be there for you. Um, and uh, I'll be skimming through the content quite quickly. Unfortunately, we have a limit of time and there's a lot that I wanted to share. And so it's gonna be skimmed through. If you have any questions, please keep it to yourself um, until the end where we should have a sizable Q&A section. And um, last but not least, connect me uh, with me on LinkedIn if you have any follow-ups that you want to do on a personal level and, uh, and do enjoy like this is um, I aim at giving this more of a fun and engaging presentation so please enjoy as much as possible and now uh, with all that said I'd like to begin with the key takeaways of this presentation um, these are the key messages that I like to to leave with you guys and so if you don't remember anything from later on uh, please remember these points uh, number one uh, when it comes to localization, translation is difficult. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you have experience with translation, but it is not as simple as you may think, just you know, translating some text from one language to another. Um, and localization is actually much more than just translation, um, even though translation in itself is, is complex enough. Uh, localization is also much more than just content localization because there's a lot of features that you want to be adapting for the local audiences as well and i'll give some examples um, and then um, a lot of the success of localization lies in the detail so the devil is in the detail uh, with all of with so much to do um, prioritization is so important so uh, i'll go through some examples of that later on um, and last but not least in my mind um, i have this concept that localization is like different trailers of the same movie and i'll give uh, i'll you know share my uh, example on that as well cool so um i am going to skip through this part because i assume that most of you have heard about airbnb or have used it previously um but uh, for those of you that may not know about this airbnb actually stands for air bed and breakfast and um, it was started out uh, back in, I think, 2012 uh, in San Francisco uh, as a platform for people to find, uh, as, a, as a platform for people to find uh, cheap stays in San Francisco. Um, the founders were actually out of job at the time and they needed to make some extra money. So they decided to um, rent out their living room. Um, in particular, uh, this is the original Airbnb that they rented out. Uh, and as a fun fact, I actually spent a night on the couch in the original Airbnb, and I also slept on an airbed in that apartment. So uh, it's a pretty cool fact that I carry around from my um, from my Airbnb career. Um, Airbnb has grown tremendously in the past 
13 years. Um, these are some crazy numbers. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but you can imagine having, you know, people from literally all over the world staying on Airbnbs and, you know, 2 million people on average staying on an Airbnb per night. So that is, uh, you know, certainly a tremendous growth that we've seen with this company, even though it's probably struggling right now with the coronavirus going around. Um, I shared a little bit about my story at Airbnb. Uh, I was uh, one of the earliest employees for the company in the region. I uh, started out actually managing hosts and focusing on bringing quality supply to some of our markets in Asia. And then uh, I transitioned to work in localization and product. Um, and so, again, this is where I'm drawing um, a lot of my uh, experiences in this presentation. So uh, why was localization so important for Airbnb even five years ago, back in 2015, right? Um, quite simply, uh, Airbnb was already an extremely international business back then. Um, two thirds of the trips uh, crosses a country border. So it was no longer a domestic business. Uh, looking at some numbers in the past, we can see that um, P1 here means the homepage majority of the page views of the homepage were already looking at the site in a non-English language. Um, half of the people looking at Help Center, like the FAQs, the articles, uh, are looking at it in a non-English language. And 61% of bookings are made from either the hosts or the guests using Airbnb in a, a non-English language. And so, you know, it really is a very international business already back then. Um, essentially, the product is used more often in non-English than in English, and so naturally, it's very important to localize it well. Now, talking about localization, uh, like I said, I'm sure most of you would associate it with translation to begin with, and it's very true uh, because it is a very important part of localization. And uh, as for Airbnb, translation was actually a huge undertaking. Um, even back when we first started, we were already spending a lot of money and resources in this area. Uh, look at some of these numbers. Um, spending 150,000 US dollars a month on both human and machine translations. Translating anywhere uh, at a given time, you know, millions and millions of words across 26 languages. And those are just the numbers from back then, you know, that's five years ago. Uh, fast forward to today, I, I learned in the news, and this, is, this came out a few days ago, that Airbnb is now translating over 100 million words in one year uh, by, with humans. And it's now supporting 62 languages instead of 26 back then. So obviously it has even exploded in terms of uh, its growth in, in, in a massive way. Now, for those of you who have translated anything before, I'm sure you would agree that producing good translation is very difficult. Um, and as for Airbnb, it's particularly hard because of a number of reasons. Um, number one, uh, the sheer volume, as uh, I alluded to, and also the diversity of content to be translated. I'll provide some examples, but it's not really just translating the UI that you see in the app, there's a lot of different content that requires translation. And with so much content to translate, prioritization then becomes very important uh, to determine what needs to get translated first. Um, another challenge that we had was that we were working with uh, a bunch of freelancers who are not full-time employees in the company. And so it's actually very important for us to educate them um, regarding the context of what they had to translate. Um, some of you might have seen those funny examples of how direct translations can be odd sounding or, or even embarrassing at times. And so that's also very important. Um, and so, you know, thinking about all of that, it's very challenging to balance speed, quality, and consistency. And um, yeah, so let's take a look at some of the examples of the type of content that we would translate. Um, on the left here, you can see that those are our core flows, so the buttons, the UI. Um, we also need to translate emails. We need to translate landing pages of different new products that we have to, to launch. Um, there's blog posts, content. There's help center articles. 
There's, uh, again, different landing pages for marketing purposes, um, as well as um, content on our mobile app, uh, or maybe uh, content of our app store descriptions. That's very important and increasingly important nowadays because that's the first thing that people see before they download your app. And, um, and so, you know, because of such diversity of volume and, and content, uh, we really needed to a tool to manage the translations, uh, you know, of so many different content types. And thankfully, back then, we had a super talented engineer. Uh, his name is Jason. Uh, he worked at Google Translate before joining um, Airbnb. And so he took it upon himself to build an internal tool uh, for us. So um, this is what it looks like. Um, here are some of the features that it provides. It automatically prioritizes strings um, based on our page views. And so we could always see uh, the most visible content on top for our translators to translate first. You can see here that there's an importance bar. Um, it provides features like glossaries, history, and uh, like Google Translate option to make it easier and more consistent uh, to produce quality translations. Um, and for web content, it would even automatically capture screenshots to show translators uh, the string, where the string is located and how it's being displayed for better context. Uh, and there's even a, a contextual translation mode that allows translators to uh, improve readers to directly submit translations and provide feedback on the site. And obviously, even with all of these advanced features, uh, we're still not able to provide sufficient context uh, for every scenario. And so we still needed to spend a lot of time and effort reviewing uh, the translated content after it's been completed in this, what's called the bulk environment. And so here are some examples of our proofreaders annotating uh, like different screenshots and reviewing our translations. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but you can see that it's, it's, it's a lot of work um, to, to annotate all of that, let alone going back to fix it. And sometimes it's not just fixing it in the translation tool. It's, uh, it has to require an engineering effort as well. So uh, like I said, uh, as you can see, it does take a lot of work. And for those of you who are interested um, more in the technical aspect of how we uh, built our translation tool and architecture, here is a blog post um, written by our engineer Jason on the topic. And uh, please be sure to check it out. Um, another thing, and, and I, I promised uh, someone in the audience uh, this, uh, actually one of the tools recently that I, I like a lot, and this is, I'm not paid by them to, to do this, but uh, there's a tool called Phrase, and they're, they're doing a really fantastic job uh, offering some of those features that I mentioned as well, so be sure to go check it out. All right, back to the scheduled content. Um, so, with all of that said, uh, what does bad localization look like, right? Um, if I haven't already convinced you how important localization is, I, I think some of these bad examples will provide you with some added motivation. Uh, now, just to clarify, these are real examples from our live product, and they're honestly quite embarrassing. Uh, take a look at this um, half-translated email with three languages in total. You can see Chinese. You can see English, and you can see Korean. Um, or this partially translated Korean homepage. And how the Japanese font here is completely messed up uh, on, on the sign-up screen, which is the first thing that our users would see back then. Um, how our UI uh, broke up Russian words into two lines. Um, how our copies are all overlapping. Notice the um, at the at near the bottom uh, under the icons, all the words are overlapping. Uh, same same here. Uh, and so, you know, actually, for this, uh, I wanted to ask someone in the audience to 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 point it out. But uh, you know, if if you speak Chinese or, or you read Chinese, you can see that. The issue here is that we were translating visa, as in the visa card, as the travel visa. And so when users are checking out, they see travel visa um, next to their visa card, which makes no sense. But that actually 
were a live screenshot and, and I had to take a photo of it because it, it was just really terrible. Uh, and it certainly, if not affect product experience, definitely embarrassed ourselves with, with providing such um, kind of experience. Um, and so with that, you know, uh, from the examples above, you can see that localization really is not just about translating text, it's also very much about the context, the tone of voice, um, is about localizing currency, date formats, line breaks, screenshots, icons, logos, a lot of those things. And, um, and so it, it is a lot of work again. So after looking at these bad examples, let me show you a few examples of better localization. Uh, this here is the app intro introduction page that we built later on. And you can notice how all the assets, including the screenshots and buttons are localized. Uh, we even went as far as localizing the faces in the screenshots to match the nationality of the language. And, and this here uh, is actually the face of one of our coworkers in Japan. And uh, we've also spent the effort of localizing the icon, the host guarantee icon in all of these languages. And um, this is, however, very time consuming, as you can imagine. So subsequently, uh, we were building some of the new pages uh, in, with non-textual icons and illustrations uh, to make it a lot easier to localize. And here, uh, we didn't just localize um, static assets. We were also localizing our campaigns, brand campaigns as well. I'm not going to play this video for time's sake, but you can see how the, the, um, in the Japanese version, the name on the card is different from the name here on the Korean version. Um, in this video, which is uh, one of the brand campaigns that we ran, um, again, skipping through this real quick. Actually, the, most of the video is uh, similar and narrated, obviously, in the local language. But over here in this scene, we were uh, localizing the languages uh, in the set. Um, and so that, that also is a special touch. Um, speaking about localization, um, Apple is always regarded as kind of the top of the line. They do a great job. And as you can see here in this comparison, side-by-side -side comparison of their uh, Chinese version and their English version, uh, you can see that they actually put in a lot of little details. Um, you know, may, you may not be able to spot them now, but all the screenshots, the icons, the examples, the app that they're featuring are all different and localized. And so even though they look pretty similar, actually, it's actually the details that they get right. Uh, and, and I think that's what really impresses, uh, and I'll regard them as, you know, top of the line, again, in, in, in the localization industry. All right. So uh, with all of that said, localization is much more than just translation and is also much more than just content localization. Um, this here is actually a feature matrix from way back when, and you can see that we were also trying to localize um, payment methods. Uh, we're trying to localize different content on the page, sign up methods, how we navigate, how users can navigate and search. And so it's, it's a lot more than just content localization. And so in the subsequent section, um, I'm going to share about you know, different dilemmas that we faced in localization. Uh, as mentioned, uh, I was one of the first product managers uh, working on the China market for Airbnb, and so that's where I'm drawing a lot of these examples. Looking at time, um, I should have, is it until 8.40, uh, 40 minutes, or just 30 minutes in this presentation? Amber? Hello? All right, I'm just going to go. Yeah. So... So the first dilemma that we faced uh, was doing or understanding. Uh, when we first decided to enter the China market, um, there's a lot of things that we wanted to do. Um, but in fact, like a lot of the time, I would suggest us to take a step back and try to understand um, your user base to begin with. Uh, luckily, we already had a lot of users, uh, a decent amount of users back then. And so we were using 
approaches like just a sign-up survey to better understand how they learn about Airbnb. Um, we were digging into people's public profiles and what they mentioned in their profiles to understand who they are. Uh, and with my limited uh, data skills back then, we were th looking at their profiles and picking up keywords and see, you know, and seeing how they're describing and introducing themselves. And we found that actually a lot of our users back then were um, students, teachers, and they mentioned university and so on. And so these are our early adopters. We're also looking at reviews. Again, all of these things are public. Um, it, might not apply to your situation, but the idea here is that leverage any content that you have on your existing users in those markets to better understand why they're using your product and your value propositions, and that's very important. Um, again, we're looking at our reviews and trying to pick out keywords that a lot of people mention, and that's how we, 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 we learn about why people were using Airbnb. Um, separately, we were also doing uh, user interviews, kind of face-to-face -face user interviews, and um, trying to understand not just our users, but also some potential users out in the market and how they treat Airbnb as a potential product. Um, and, and we were also visiting a lot of local companies to learn about you know, differences and so on. So from all of that, we were uh, able to uh, generate local insights that were otherwise unknown to us or our teams in 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 San Francisco, so that we were uh, and that is very important to to tailor some of our experiences later on. Um, one of the things that we did after learning so much about the the local market is that we realized that you know at least back then the Chinese market, the Chinese audience is really just starting to go overseas, and those so they need a lot more handholding, inspiration, and guidance. Uh, in determining where to travel and where to stay and so on. And, uh, and so from there, we actually uh, decided to develop a China-specific feature um, that is focused more on kind of these uh, travel journals. Uh, and, and you can still see it today um, in, in, as part of Airbnb's China-specific feature. Um, another dilemma that uh, we had back then is determining uh, what is essential and what's just good to have. Um, basically, it's prioritization. Um, but I still remember that the first thing that we decided to do was um, adding Weibo as a lock-in method. Um, so, you know, that's what it looked like. Um, but all along, we weren't taking enough time to learn about how our product are actually working uh, with our users. Um, through user research um, in uh, China and in Korea and Japan, we realized that our support back then for um, Internet Explorer, earlier versions of Internet Explorer were actually very terrible. And so our photos wouldn't even load. Um, this is, a, again, a real interview. And we captured it at a real interview. And this is our, what a homepage we're looking like. Uh, regardless of how pretty it looks in, for some of maybe our U.S. users, none of our photos were loading. Uh, and our map weren't loading, for instance. And so, you know, these in perspective are way more important uh, to fix and to, to, to localize when you enter a new market. And so the, the lesson here really is, all right, I'm sure everyone has ideas of what to do uh, in, in a specific market, maybe it has to do with social sharing or payment and so on. But, you know, take a step back and make sure that you are going through your core product and addressing the most fundamental features uh, to begin with. And that was certainly a lesson that we learned along the way. And again, it, it is certainly embarrassing. Uh, and this is more examples of how our homepage were not loading for IE users and, and, and so on. Um, another, another dilemma or decision that we had to make is uh, whether or not to work on the top of the funnel or the bottom of the funnel. Um, this is how I'm thinking about it uh, when it comes to localization. Uh, imagine like the gaps of the bow tie is, is you know, the gaps of a local market and your, say, domestic, say, the U.S. market or wherever it is. I think the biggest gaps often appear at the awareness stage, at the very top of the funnel, and at the, you know, kind of the purchase or at the very end of the funnel. So what we did, obviously, was uh, we worked on localizing the paid growth channel. So we had to 
And this is obviously what uh, Grove Marketer Academy is good at figuring out how to drive traffic, how to do ads. And obviously in China, they use Baidu instead of Google. And now obviously TikTok instead of Facebook and all of those things. And you really got to localize your advertising channel to get the traffic that you want. Um, another thing that we did, uh, I've shown glimpses of them, is our local marketing assets. Our marketing team, our brand marketing team produced these local campaigns to at least showcase, you know, local narration, local faces, to make the brand seem more familiar and uh, to, to you know, have a better image of our brand. Uh, we were also doing local collaborations. And this one, I remember vividly, we uh, partnered with you know, Magastar G Dragon for him to uh, rent out his studio and w worked as a host uh, for, for one night. And that obviously caught a lot of attention as well. Uh, we were also producing, you know, educational content, uh, teaching people how to use our products back then. And again, local narration, local content. I think those are quite important. As for the bottom of the funnel, what we did uh, were, you know, localizing payment methods, uh, as well as, um, you know, localizing ways for people to do things like verifying their ID. Um, back then, you know, ID verification was a core security feature for Airbnb. And actually, a lot of users in Asia were failing at that final step. And we had to figure out ways, uh, alternative ways to verify them. Um, and so that was also an important piece for us. Um, another key decision that we had, uh, and it was a dilemma for sure, is uh, whether or not to uh, run experiments, you know, scientific experiments. Uh, A-B tests, uh, sometimes we call it, or just go with our gut feel and say, let's just make this change, right? Um, at Airbnb, it is a very data-driven company. Um, this this came you know, after I left the company, but uh, from this, uh, this is a data scientist that I worked with. She mentioned that Airbnb was running close to 100 experiments in a week uh, in the beginning, and when she was writing this article, it was close to 700. So everything was made using experimentation. Um, there were a lot of custom tools within Airbnb that helps us run experiments easily. And uh, so these are some examples from the, from the past. But actually, uh, running experiments are also not as easy when you're entering a new market. And I'll mention some of those examples. Uh, before going to that, though, uh, I like to mention this one thing uh, to illustrate how much uh, Airbnb was uh, obsessed with the idea of experimentation. Now, back uh, back in a few slides earlier, I showed you how our maps were not loading for Internet Explorer users, and so for a long time, this is how uh, our product looked like for some of those users: uh, uh, Airbnb without a map. Uh, and so we continued for a while, and you know, uh, users have to use our product without a map. Only until we ran an experiment uh, with uh, with Canada, we picked a random market and say, "Hey, like, let's take away the map feature for this market uh, for a week and see what happens." And it ends up, you know, bringing in I think ten or twenty percent less bookings. And only after that were we able to convince the engineering team to find an alternative map solution uh, to replace it for, for Internet Explorer. That's how far we had to use experimentation back then to convince change. Well, obviously, I mean, for, from my perspective, I think it's pretty intuitive that a travel company requires a map to show people where they're staying. Uh, and I'm trying to use an example to, to illustrate to you guys that, hey, like maybe it's not always required to go this scientific route. If, it's, if it makes sense, if it's intuitive, you know, just do it. Um, but this is what we ended up doing. We replaced the map with the alternative provider. Um, and as mentioned, there are other uh, factors that are making it more challenging for us to make, uh, run experiments. Uh, for one, uh, our sample size is a lot smaller. You know, we're focusing on a much smaller user base. And so, uh, you know, oftentimes the quality of the sample is not uh, as, as, as great. And we have to run um, a lot of, run the experiments a lot longer in order to reach a conclusion. Um, another thing that is very important to know is that when we run experiments, we're assuming, we're making the assumptions that the subsequent users that come to your platform is going to be the same as the ones in your experiment group right now. That's why you would 
consider that experiment legitimate. But in your early growth stage, the new users coming in next week or the week after, a month after, might not be the same as the experiment group. And so even though you run an experiment and it holds true that this group of users uh, in general prefer the red button more, they convert more with the red button, it may not mean that it's the case with your subsequent users. And so you know, these are certain things to, to be mindful of when running experiments, especially for early growth stage markets. I'm going to go through some of these examples very quickly. Uh, we did run a lot of experiments. Uh, this is our attempt to roll out a new homepage uh, specifically for China. We added some educational content, a curated list of destinations. Um, but you know, for all the reasons that I mentioned, it was actually an inclusive and we wrote it back. Um, this is another example that I mentioned. We added Weibo as a sign-in method. We also didn't see any results, but we rolled it out instead uh, regardless. Um, this is our second attempt to roll out a new homepage. Again, we didn't see any results. Um, this right here is a, a new search experience for the China market. Instead of just typing, uh, actually, we feel that users in China prefer tapping on different options. And we so we built this. Uh, but again, we didn't see any results. Again, it doesn't mean that these ideas are not good ideas. But for whatever reason back then, maybe our audience were too small. We just couldn't run it long enough to see that it's bringing a significant or insignificant results or positive or negative results. So those are examples that we learned. Um, here are some successful examples. Uh, because we weren't able to use Google, we had to do this sort of uh, uh, build our own type ahead experience, a kind of predictive search. Uh, and that was actually very successful in, in driving more bookers. Uh, the map example I've already mentioned. Uh, we also spent a lot of effort speeding up our, our, um, our product. And um, for this one, it's about making our map load faster. And it actually brought a significant uh, lift in the amount of nights that, uh, that were booked in the experiment. Um, there's a lot more examples. So I think for time's sake, I'm going to skip through them. But you can take a look. And if you have any questions, um, you can ask me about them. Uh, these are some more uh, examples that are significant in the end. And I'm actually going to talk about it in the next section as well. So related to all of that, uh, apart from just thinking about whether or not we run experiments or just roll something out, uh, we also need to determine whether we're just running or just making incremental changes or making more drastic changes. I mean, in the beginning, um, we were making pretty incremental changes. We were saying, oh, maybe we should change the photo on the homepage carousel. Uh, we ran an experiment with these four groups and four photos, and, and they weren't um, conclusive. We didn't reach any results. Um, we also added a banner on the homepage to better um, advertise our trust features. We say, hey, now, we accept uh, Alipay uh, you know, as a payment method. We also use Weibo as a verification method, stuff like that. I think it's very meaningful content, but it didn't bring any you know, measurable results from in that regard. And so after you know, doing those things that are more incremental, like changing a photo here, adding a banner here, we started with more drastic changes, um, like, like this one where we're really kind of redesigning the stack of what our homepage looks like, uh, and we try to, uh, for instance, instead of using the generic search results page on the left, uh, where people, let's say you're searching for Taiwan as a destination, uh, we'll, we'll land users on that page. We created a landing page with more descriptions, with some reviews here and there. Uh, and these are you know, more drastic changes that we're testing. And that actually brought you know, very significant results for us. Um, or rather, we would be doing something that are, you know, we call zero to one. We didn't used to send, you know, notifications in, in the Chinese language. Uh, and we started doing that and we obviously saw um, improvements there as well. So the whole idea here is to think about, you know, more drastic changes that you can be making. And perhaps that would also bring more measurable, more significant results. Because again, making incremental changes in the beginning might not really prove to be positive or negative. You think that an incremental change is meaningful, just do it. It's not worth running an experiment and waiting you know, weeks for you to reach a conclusion there. Um, the sixth uh, dilemma here is uh, 
bit more technical. Uh, it is about whether or not to, uh, you know, your engineering team would fork the code or not. Um, and basically, essentially what this means is that you would be developing new features on a different branch. Uh, and so you're deviating away from what the core product looked like. And there are issues with it. Um, Take, for instance, I'll use the map example. Uh, we were trying to switch out Google Maps with uh, something called OpenStreetMap that works and load well for the China market because Google Maps is blocked, obviously. Um, but because we're building it on top of the existing product, little did we know that even though it worked for a lot of pages, it didn't work for this feature here, uh, which is a neighborhood feature that outlines you know, uh, very nicely where this neighborhood is. But instead, uh, it didn't work with this map that we're using. So we have to be very careful when we're localizing features on top of the existing product because we're not building it from scratch. And so oftentimes you need to do a lot more testing to make sure that it is actually working well with all of the different scenarios that exist in the current product. Um, another thing uh, that we ran into is that because, we again, we were making changes on top of the existing product, Sometimes when our teams, our global teams go back and change some underlying logic uh, for the core product, it may mess up our features. Take for instance, this is a, an incident that happened where our search bar was unusable uh, because we, we changed it, we, we made it tappable, and the subsequent changes on the global team render it uh, unusable for a while. And, and that was also a, a negative aspect of forking you know, your experience and building specific features for a certain region or, or country. Right, I'm uh, running out of time, but I'll breeze through this very quickly. Um, another thing as a product manager to think about is oftentimes you would be asked by your local marketing team or other counterparts to make changes and you just need to decide whether it's always a one-time change or a scalable change that can also benefit subsequent um, efforts like for instance we've been asked to oh add this banner on the home page to play a video or uh, do this integration with this specific partner that requires a lot of you know back end and uh, back end efforts uh, we were asked to create different landing pages for specific campaigns and and a lot of these examples here right and so my suggestion is to always take a step back and think about whether that is a scalable approach and only ship those features using your internal teams. If it's a really one-off thing that has to be done, um, if resources allow, you know, let them, let the marketing team or other uh, teams leverage an external resource. Like this, for instance, is a very specific mini site that were built, that were outsourced, and we weren't building it. Um, in contrast, we were building these tools globally for anyone to be able to generate um, you know, landing pages uh, and give out discounts, for instance. And so this is scalable. Um, another thing that's scalable here is what's called the Night App tool. I mentioned previously that we ran a G-Dragon campaign uh, for people to, you know, to, to enter a contest to stay with him. And so you know, we built this tool that is configurable by any team anywhere in the world to run similar campaigns like this. So these are, you know, very useful tools that will benefit not just one instance, but subsequently it can be it can be scaled up and benefit many more scenarios as well. Um, the last piece that I want to mention here is when it comes to localization, uh, it's not just about building these technological uh, solutions, although I was proposing it, you know, for it to be scalable, but sometimes it's also about just putting in more human efforts. Uh, take, for instance, when we first enter Japan and China and, and a lot of Asian markets, uh, we actually put at the website the customer service hotline. This is something that we don't do at all for some of the more mature markets because we don't want that contract rate to be so high. We don't want people to be calling us. But initially, in these earlier markets, for you to instill confidence, you may need to spend more manual um, efforts and this may mean that exposing your phone numbers for people to reach out to you to um, you know to give them a sense of trust. Uh, it may also mean that in some you know this is an example that I gave earlier uh, in ID verification we intentionally put a link here for them to reach out to our customer service team because we know this is the final step before they can make a booking and so again it means more customer service tickets 
but it's a necessary step in um, in in an earlier stage uh, as you're entering a new market. Uh, the last example I'm going to give here is that uh, at Airbnb we have this saying called "Do things that don't scale." Uh, in the growth story, initial growth story, the reason why Airbnb picked up was because our founders realized the photos that people are posting are so terrible, and so they ended up going door to door to different early host and take photos for them. And I don't know whether this is still running, but during my four years at Airbnb, we still offered free for professional photography for a lot of hosts. And you know, you may think that it's crazy to the uh, crazy cost to do something like that. But sometimes such services are necessary um, when it comes to you know, getting your company or your idea to the next stage. Um, this here are some examples of what Airbnb's current product look like in China. You can see a lot of the things that we implemented back then uh, continue on to the product today. And so, you know, uh, localization does go very far, uh, is my point here. All right. So uh, in conclusion, uh, a few, few more minutes here. Um, I want to talk about what I think are good localization in my mind. Um, this is KFC uh, in China. It's one of the more popular fast food chains out there. You look at it, you still think that it's KFC. The branding is similar, but upon a closer look, they are still selling fried chicken, but they're also selling kanji in the morning, right? They're uh, providing localized promotions and payment methods for users. Um, and they're engaging with local celebrities for their brand campaigns. And so, you know, it's not so much about reinventing your product. They're still selling fried chicken, but they do it in a way that is more relevant to the local market. Um, you take a look at Xiaomi, right? Like, this is some of the earlier photos, but their products look exactly the same as an iPhone, especially earlier on. <laughs> this is their, uh, the Mi Pad or whatever they call it, but it looks exactly like how you know, Apple would, would market their products. But what's different, uh, despite all the aesthetic similarities, is that they they run these uh, local meetups and they have these online communities that are very active. And they often do a lot more promotions, which Apple doesn't do. So there are so many things that they do differently. Or like today, Xiaomi sells everything from a water boiler to a TV to, you know, whatever, like a, a robot uh, cleaner. Uh, for your home. And so that's how they differ in strategies, not so much about aesthetics uh, in, in a way, but about execution as well. Um, last but not least, I mentioned this idea of different trailers, uh, same movie. Um, I would suggest you to go check this out, but um, this is, uh, I think this is a Captain America movie. You can see in different versions that they show in different countries, this little book that Captain America was holding actually have different lists that are customized for the local market. Uh, and the last example I'm going to give here is that go check out the, this trailer of this movie, Brave. It's a Disney movie uh, that came out a while ago. But if you look at their English trailer and their Japanese trailer, it may seem like two completely different movies. Um, but in the end, when people go to the cinema, it's the same movie. So when it comes to localization in my mind, I think is more about making a trailer uh, really, really well and connecting with the local audience and drawing them in, but not, you know, making a new movie altogether, um, similar to the example that I gave for uh, for KFC. So with that, I uh, really breezed it through 180 slides. I hope this is meaningful and um, love to answer some questions and actually see you guys because I, I can't see anything when presenting. All right, Amber, Lauren. Yeah, cool. Hi, so uh, you may be wondering who Lauren is. Uh, Hi. So, <laughs> Hi, so let's talk about Lauren. She's uh, one of our book and alumni now working at GoBear as the original SEO specialist. And she will be co-hosting the Q&A session with Julian. So it's kind of like a panel discussion. So we want this webinar to be highly interactive. Please raise ask Julian questions in the Q&A panel and upvote for those who want to get answers to. The uh, top three voted questions will be answered as a priority to Julian. So ask your questions now. 
Okay, uh, first of all, thanks Julian for showcasing a lot of great example and the benefit of adopting a localization strategy. And as Amber already mentioned, I'm the uh, SEO specialist in GoBear, and I do see some common between Airbnb and GoBear because uh, Instead of selling accommodation, Gobia is a platform that allows users to compare different financial products, for example, credit card or insurance. And we do have a certain level of localization in terms of product and in terms of content. And I know most of you are pretty interested on how to adopt localization. So here comes with the Q&A section. And the top voted question is that at what stage do you suggest having a localization team support when planning to enter a new market? Um, thanks for the question, uh, Dominique. Uh, I think that... Um, it really depends. Um, if you're a business that plans on opening up an office uh, in a specific market uh, as part of your entry, you know you probably are going to be hiring local marketing uh, people or, or uh, customer service. Um, oftentimes, in the in initial stage, we would just leverage those resources and dedicate them to localization as a part-time uh, on a part-time basis. In fact, the whole uh, reason why I got into localization at Airbnb, at Airbnb was because I was doing it part-time uh, as, as, a, as a, my main responsibility was engaging with hosts. But I actually think it's actually a good idea to start leveraging uh, not dedicated people for localization to begin with because these are people that understand your product and you want them to uh, deliver the most relevant type of content, um, if, if that makes sense. Obviously, when your product grows in terms of the volume and different content types and so on, you do need to have a dedicated person thinking about all those prioritization and so on. Um, but initially, I feel that it's not necessary to hire someone that's dedicated um, to, 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 to localizing. And in fact, uh, at Airbnb, we tend not to reach out to agencies in the initial stage uh, because these are people that don't know what your product is. And so they, they, you know, as you see, have seen in some of the bad examples, they don't oftentimes pr provide the most relevant, uh, uh content. Uh, so I'd say, you know, use someone that understand your product initially, maybe try to limit it in scale, uh, and, and go from there. If it really picks up, then it warrants a dedicated resource. Okay. The next question, actually, it's my question. Uh, if my company is currently adopting centralization model um, without historical data support, how can I predict the result or ROI of adopting localization in order to convince my boss? For sure. Um, it, it's, it's difficult. And I, I think that uh, as a combination of, of market research, uh, you know, sizing the opportunity, for this specific market, when we when we looked into um, entering the China market, obviously we have our some of our business teams and financial teams look into oh how big is the pie? You know, if we get one percent of the market, what does it imply? So you know, just in general, whether the market is lucrative for your business can come externally. Um, but in terms of looking at whether or not you should invest in uh, maybe translating your product in a certain language. I think nowadays you can look into a lot of data around, say, Google Analytics, around pe where people are coming from. Uh, there's also analytical tools that allows you to look at uh, what language are they using in, in their phones, uh, for instance, uh, looking at the phone number of, uh, you know, what type of phone numbers or email addresses they were signing up with. There's a lot of hints that you can get from your existing products uh, or existing tools. And so I think those are a good start. It's a combination of the market in general and, you know, competitive analysis, but also whether or not you've already gotten good traction um, already. 
And that, that was uh, some of the examples that I've given for Airbnb. We saw that there's already a lot of users that are maybe they're Chinese, but they're studying abroad. And so we took that as a hint that, oh, wow, like this is a market probably uh, that's worth investing in. And um, as a follow, follow up question is that there's some company that would copy the business model of a successful Western company in China. And okay. I know some of the company, for example, Chujia and Xiaoju are the uh, local example that copy Airbnb. So how Airbnb differentiate from this kind of local company? For sure. Um, that was the question that we, we asked ourselves um, all the time. Uh, I think, so for Airbnb's case, specific case, um, we tried differentiating ourselves with the global supply that we had. Um, initially, when we first entered the China market, we were trying to catch the, the global, the outbound travel type of uh, uh, traffic. We're not, we know that there's a lot of domestic players and they're trying to you know, really roll, uh, push the idea of having homestays and these minsus, right, uh, in China. But we thought that our advantage is our global supply. And so we actually uh, uh, made a lot of effort to promote outbound travel, people going overseas. Uh, and we're trying to capture these, we call it um, kind of uh, independent travelers to go abroad. Um, that strategy, however, has changed over the years because outbound travel is limited. People in China only travel a couple of times a year. They don't have that many holidays. And so now I think uh, Airbnb has majority business that's domestic. And that means a really strong shift in investing in local operations, investing in promotions and so on. And that actually, that has less to do with product or content localization. It's really a business model shift. And so um, oftentimes it's necessary, um, but I think, you know, in, in the initial stage of entering a market, if you can't have a unique value proposition uh, that can last your maybe the initial growth for, for a year or two, that makes it very difficult. So I, I think that is something to consider as well. Uh, you will be copied, but initially you have to see some uptake and, and Airbnb did that. You know, I think by the time it left, it was already in the millions of users. Uh, and so, you know, at least that was sufficient to power our, our, our first stage of growth. But pivot is often required uh, for, you know, subsequent subsequent growth as well. Okay. The next question is, uh, what would the first thing you suggest to do for localization with only limited resources? And can you share the most important on-site localization feature with us? Yeah, as I alluded to earlier, um, I think that uh, the, the most important thing is to ask your initial team, like even if let's say you hire a general manager for the market, uh, he or she should be looking at your product, be it a website or an app and put on the hat of a user and be able to tell you what's the most important. As I mentioned uh, because I don't know what product you work on. You can tell me more later on, but uh, the top of the funnel is important. Thinking about how to drive users uh, organically and through paid channels. So you got to figure that out because even if your product doesn't change, you need to be able to drive users in. So I think that's one thing, one area of work. And that means finding local advertising partners, figuring out how to place ads and localize your assets and so on. Um, and I think the second part is it depends on your product, but the core flow, right? Like when, when in the ex uh, examples that I shared, you know, for Airbnb is about signing up, is about search, is about payments, uh, is about verifying your ID. Those are core experiences that, or, or at least taking a step back, making sure that the map is displayed, right? Some of those things are super core to the funnel. And without them being uh, in a good stage, your product doesn't work, right? So I think those are the more important touch points. It doesn't have to be very fancy or, you know, like it requires a lot of efforts to make those videos that I said, and maybe it's a bit wasteful for, for a startup stage to just make a video and, and change this little detail. But, you know, start with thinking about traffic acquisition as well as the core flows that make or break your product. 
Uh, I think that's that's a good place to start. And again, you don't need to hire you know, professionals for it. Just hire, you know, maybe you have a local team or even a friend. Let them go through the product and tell you, wow, like, this just doesn't work. So let's start with fixing those things. Okay. The next one. Tim wants to know how do you prioritize the localization feature, especially when you kickstart it from scratch at the beginning stage? Do you have a localization team with dedicated developer or designer to implement it, or it most on um, project base? Uh, in my mind, um, I, I don't think it should be a dedicated team to begin with. Uh, like I said. If the feature is so central to your product, if the experience is so central to your product, then you should have the existing team work on it. The, the example uh, that I have is that, well, in, in my experience, even if you hire a dedicated engineer or a designer to work on something like that, because it touches the core experience or the core flows, you still have to go back to... Uh, you know, communicating with, say, the search team at Airbnb back when I was there or uh, the payments team to figure out how do you customize that feature for that particular portion of the flow. The biggest difference of a localization team as maybe some of the other core teams is that the core teams work vertically. Um, oftentimes, there's a product manager for payments. There's an engineer for search. They are very much laser focused in, in looking at improving one specific area of the product, whereas for a localization manager or a localization product manager or whoever working on localization, you're looking across the board horizontally trying to improve every single part of your product. And so, I, you know, it's always better to get those people working on the core experience to work on it with you uh, than to, you know, have some sort of task force to change the product. And oftentimes it will result in uh, some of the bad examples that I, I mentioned, maybe uh, changing something without the core team knowing, and then they then change something that messed up with your changes. Uh, it, it, it's, it's quite, uh, it's, it would be a messy situation uh, for that. So I, I feel that, you know, again, if, if going back to the earliest example, if your product is starting to get traction and there's a significant portion of your product that is being used by a non, whatever the original language is, uh, of a speaker that is, uh, then you should convince the product owner or the product manager to think that they also have to deliver a good experience in the non core languages in order for it to be a good experience. As an owner of certain features, you gotta make sure that everybody, not just the native speakers, uh, would be able to you know, use that feature. So uh, a lot of it is education and awareness, but I don't think it should be some sort of standalone team working on the side if it's, it's something that's important for you. If no further question, maybe Amber, you can wrap it up for us. Let's thank Julian and Warren for their time in the emoji panel. Let's give them seven pauses and in. Yeah, using emoji. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you, Julian, for your sharing. And thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in today. Um, so if you have any suggestions on this webinar, please let us know in the chat room. And we also like to know what other topics you'd like to hear and who would you like to hear it from. Yeah, so All that's right. pretty much it. Thank and you, Thanks, Lauren. Thanks. Have a good night, everyone.